Innocence, not the uh, TV series, although I'm sure we'll be touching on all of that. Uh, this is Mamoru Oshii's film, not his first film, by a long shot, um, but uh, one of the ones that certainly made a lot of, uh, made a big splash internationally, um, as well as in, uh, uh, in Japan as well. Um, so I think, like, there's a lot to talk about here, certainly. Um, what are your all sort of um, history with Ghost in the Shell? Oh, I go way back with this. This is <clears throat> one of my, this is actually one of my favorite franchises, even though it's kind of all over the place. Um, the only reason why I got into it was because of the Mini Tank Police. So okay. Of course, yep. so, you know, saw the Mini Tank Police before, which is another shroud of um, efforts manga and anime and there are sort of corollary uh, cameo kind of certain connections between the main tank police and Ghost in the Shell mm -hmm. they're really superficial um, but once I learned that Ghost in the Shell was done by this guy I was just like oh okay I'll check it out I really like the mm -hmm. tank police the main tank police has a special place in my heart mm -hmm. so I gave it a shot and I was just like oh my god I love this because I'm mm -hmm. a big into the cyberpunk genre mm -hmm. so you know Blade Runner William Gibson mm -hmm. you know I have um, George Allen Gelfinger one of the books up here mm -hmm. um, over here actually this guy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know stuff like that so it really appealed to me um, watched it and just grooved on it because it was just it, it was just right up right up my alley and over the years watching the different you know iterations of it because you know in a sense, it's kind of part of the original movie, and it's not really a sequel. It's just kind of in addition, in addition to, the, to, the, to the original. Movie. By the way, mm -hmm. that that is the cover of 2.0, folks. So if you're mm -hmm. looking for the original, it looks a little bit different than that. Yep. Um, so uh, and then, of course, you know, there's the manga behind me. The story behind that one is that I bought it from my library when I'm at the head of a yep, a book okay. sale. And the mistake I made, but Brent, you probably didn't make that I didn't pay attention to actually what was inside just bothered because it was Ghost in the Shell. And I wanted it, and I got home, and I opened it up. And see the Japanese on there? Yeah, there's no there's no English in that book. So I was like, it looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just something I, I just love, and I have loved for many, many years. John, how about you? Uh, Vin, Vin. Yep, Vin, I know. In I know. Like, I know. Uh, uh, cool. Um, tsunami. <laughs> yep. And like so many things, like initially seeing Bebop, I jumped in. I don't even know where. And <laughs> then I kept seeing bits and pieces of it that I was. I didn't understand that the major initially that the major was cyborg. Or that oh. anybody was enhanced. Uh, I was trying uh, to figure things out. I'm like, ah, oh, why is who's the dude with the little white eyes? I'm like, I don't know. What is this? So it, it, this is the first time that I sat down and watched a thing that was entirely encased within itself. Otherwise, it's mm. just been pieces everywhere. It made no sense to me. Yep, <laughs> yep, I hear that. So I like um, Blade Runner. I, I like the cyberpunk kind of thing. So it, mm -hmm. it, you know, I enjoyed watching it. It was not like pulling teeth. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I had a similar um, situation to Steve's um, big sci-fi fan growing up, you know, reading Neuromancer and Snow Crash and all, all the classics, um, and then hearing about Ghost in the Shell and watching it. Although, my difference is I watched Ghost in the Shell. I did not like this movie when I first watched it. I thought it was absurdly pretentious and, and very poorly structured and so forth. And it's taken some time in reading a lot of articles about Ghost in the Shell to kind of come around and understand kind of where they were coming from, what the kind of intent was, if you will, um, and how some of the different pieces come together. So it's one of those, you know, fair enough. Like, I, I kind of get it now, <laughs> um, uh, where it was all coming from. Uh, and it should be pointed out, like, uh, you know, I, I think every single Ghost in the Shell production uh, takes its own direction with Ghost in the yeah. Shell and right. finds its own different sort of take on the, uh, the concept. Even the original manga doesn't really fit in with any of the other adaptations it's, it's all different not at all no um the live action one doesn't really fit in with anything yeah no. uh, we, we, we pretend that doesn't exist <laughs> oh no we pretend oh, that okay we we will argue this we will do a thing <laughs> oh. in fact hey, i would I love this fight i would love 
for all of us to watch the live action version and talk about it and, and contrast it. I think there's some very interesting okay. things to talk about, about that. Anyway, anyway. All right, fair we enough. We are here fair for the enough. for the fair enough, fair enough. We're here for the ninety five version. Um, uh, but yeah, so the, and, the, and it's one of the important things is the ninety five version is a very heavily philosophical, very dark, very um, thoughtful movie. And it's one of, one of the things that I, I really realized rewatching it this time is oh she has this. Ten- Are you all familiar with the idea of the pointer scene in movies? Um, it's a thing I think George Lucas came up with where he said um, in any action movie, in any story. There's always one scene where everybody sits down and somebody explains the backstory of the thing you're trying to find. Somebody basically pulls out a chalkboard and a pointer and says, so you understand, there's a thing and there's, here's a map and we have to go to here and go to there because this person's over there, or whatever. Okay. There's always some scene like that. And it's actually, it's named, it, it's, it didn't start here, but it's named for the scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where Indy and the FBI agents all sit down and Indy explains about the arc and all that kind of backstory. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this is the thing both Lucas and Spielberg have talked about. They said, no matter how you structure your action movie, you will always have a pointer scene. You can try the, as hard as you can, but there seems to be some immutable law of the universe that eventually you will have to have a scene where you kind of explain to the audience what's going on. Ghost in the Shell is like 50% pointer scenes. <laughs> uh, it's true. It's true. You know, it's true. And the thing that she likes to do a lot is have characters just stop and s- quote Nietzsche. Exposition. And just do exposition and all this kind of stuff. And in fairness, talking. In lots very of talking. lots of talking. <laughs> um, and in fairness, one of the things I really like about, about the movie is that there's a lot of great stuff, um, uh, is that there are very few um, as-you-know-Bob scenes in Ghost in the Shell. Um, in the sense of, you know, uh, the Major walking up to Aramaki, uh, her superior, and Ar- Aramaki saying, well, as you know, Major, you know, we are a Fushu Super Secret organization that does X, Y, yeah. you know. Um, so it may just get woven in pretty well in terms of the plot, but there's a lot of that, and there's a lot of this just kind of literally characters. I remember th- there's the scene on the boat where they're talking, and yeah. literally the major just stares into the lens and just starts quoting philosophy at you, and it's like, okay, Yoshi, I know what you're trying to do here. Like I get it. Like like maybe find a slightly subtler way of doing it. Um, <laughs> And, and she does it with her, like, completely unblinking giant mm-hmm. eyes, where it's like, it feels a little uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> well, well, the, the facial does look like an oni. Oh, interesting. Yeah, the, the way yeah. that the eyes kind of go up like this, and right. the yeah. face kind of goes up, and it's very bland, and it's very intense. Well, and that's, and that's one of the, the big themes of Ghost in the Shell, so it's worth mentioning. You know, one of the, one of the very common things about Ghost in the Shell is that, you know, the humans in the movie are um, very inhuman. They're very plastic. You know, they don't have much emotion. They don't, they, they don't uh, react much. Um, which is obviously one of the themes, the big themes is what makes a human human, uh, what makes a human human. Um, and I think it also gets to the fact that the character designs are very different. They're not traditional anime character designs. Right. Um, and they, they do have that slightly disconcerting, slightly odd, much less like, you know, Bato's eyes, all that stuff. Right. Um, but it does feel very off-putting in, in a way that I think, again, is kind of intentional. Well, at least Bato, you, he, there, it's just little white discs. Mm-hmm. The major, she just stares at you. Yeah. yeah. yeah it doesn't, it's like, mm-hmm. there's no point you know, in blinking. She doesn't yeah, blink. She, she just doesn't. She stares yeah. at you. <laughs> so it's mm-hmm. kind of like... Okay, I got kind of used to seeing the button eyes with Bato. Yeah. <laughs> Where it's like, okay, I like, I understood that part, but it's like, I you know, hers, it's like she looks more real mm-hmm. or flesh. Yeah. But, you know, the whole scene where you see how she is fleshed. Yeah, let's talk about that, that scene, yeah. You know, that, that I, obviously you don't need to flick, but it's just, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, that's an interesting choice on that. You could have her be like the replicants. Mm-hmm. You know, in Blade Runner, and they look entirely like people. They blink like yeah. people. They everything else, but no, very stylistic choice to have her stare entirely with no blinking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, 
and that gets to sort of two things. One is that, and you, you do get that whole introductory sequence where they're very much telling you these are created people, you know, they're, yeah. they're yeah. original brains, but otherwise. And it should be pointed out, and it's one of the things that fortunately they do point out in the movie, is that, you know, they've signed away their bodies to Section 9. So, yeah. you know, this body has been designed specifically for the sort of counter-terrorism stuff they're doing. It doesn't need to look pretty. It doesn't need to look whatever. It just needs to blend in reasonably. And what's interesting about that point is that that is a point that is actually belabored in Arise, mm. the, the the Arise um, series. Yeah, which is people can't tell if it's a reboot or or yeah. a you know, prequel, whatever. But um, and in this movie, but in other in the other Ghost in the Shell stuff, it's really not. I think it's mentioned in the manga maybe mm -hmm. once. Um, but for the rest of the series and stuff like that, it's it's not mentioned at all. Yeah. And by the time twenty forty five comes around, the, that series, which I, yeah, mm. um, they seem to be free of that contract. But mm. um, but it's it's they get more into an arise than they do in this movie. But it sets up the concept of of sure you can quit, but all you're going to be is in a brain in a brain case because you don't have mm. any of these things. Yeah. And that's when the discussion from her on the boat comes to, well, you know, this is how I define who I am. This is mm -hmm. my body, and this is how my perceptions, how I'm linked into the networks, how I'm mm -hmm. able yeah. to do these things. This is all I know. Mm -hmm. So if you want to give up that, and you're comfortable with that, with giving up your 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 weird eyes, <laughs> which are basically your button eyes, uh, your button eyes. It then you know go ahead but all you're going to be is a brain in a box and you're mm. not going to have a body which also houses your ghost mm. which is which is she is the closest thing that that the anime comes to saying you do have a soul you have a ghost you have something extraneous mm. but it doesn't live inside your brain it lives inside of your shell it lives inside mm. of your body and that's what yeah. she's trying to explain to Bato yeah. is that there's this other perception that you mm -hmm. come to not be able to live without. Yeah. Right. And in fairness, I, to the technical aspect, I believe in the manga they, they point out that by the time you have worked for Section 9 for a couple of years, you've saved up enough cash that when you do right, check yeah. out, you can buy three buy bodies three you want. You know, you, you, you're, you're good. But still. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, uh, and it should be pointed out, by the way, um, when they use that word ghost, they are saying in the Japanese, gosto. It is, it's not a traditional Japanese concept it is a loan word indicating a foreign weird idea that we don't quite have a handle on which I really like um, and I do like the fact that in, in this in, in this uh, universe there's this idea that like we've we've discovered that there is this kind of ghost thing and nobody really knows what it is like it's just there's there's this aspect out there that doesn't quite fit into all the science and we can probably explain it eventually, but it's still kind of this unknown. Yeah, we don't, it, like, they sit on the boat, and then this little girl's voice comes out of nowhere. Mm. And Bato is just like, uh, you did say that, right? You, you did say it, pointing to the major. Major's mm -hmm. like, one, uh, no, that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. So there is that, and that's kind of where the, the genesis of the actual two two seasons of um, mm. SAC SAC mm -hmm. comes from is is that kind of moment where they start to learn that there are these ghost entities mm. well, the, yeah. the puppet master yeah. is the puppet a, is a ghost, ghost of a ghost, ghost. You know, yeah. Yeah. an yeah. artificial ghost yeah like, mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting concept. Is this like brain mapping where you just sort of flash <laughs> onto an electronic brain mm -hmm. the synaptic functions of Well they try to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well they try to do that in the movie and they can't and they can't find it. They can't pinpoint it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really weird in that one scene where the, the technicians mm -hmm. uh, the red robes that kind of remind me for some reason of Star Wars like mm -hmm. Darth mm -hmm. Wars. Yeah. yeah. Imperial guards, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um they they're trying to do the map and they say okay and you see the the cgi thing coming in and you see mm -hmm. the brain but then you discover that they're saying yeah but there's no brain in there yeah mm -hmm. you know this is it's completely yeah, this, inorganic yeah. there's not an yeah, organic right. component yeah, to it yeah, yeah and yeah, th this is a world of it's a, a entirely i guess post human world whatever you, whatever you call it where you can take a you know a mind transfer it outside of a body into a you know, 
completely digital representation. Um, um, in fact, um, in the the manga and I think the, the series in the series and I think in Innocence as well, there's the whole the, the, uh, ghost dubbing thing yes. where they find yeah. people are are doing that with like kids and so forth and very creepy. Um, yeah. Um, oh, solid state society. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then that you know, again opens up interesting questions about uh, you know if your brain is literally just ones and zeros. Like, what are you? <laughs> you know? um, well, it's when the puppet master is talking, to, you know, about yeah. a being a life form. It's like all I could think of was data from Star Trek. Mm -hmm. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, what constitutes when they had the trial for data? What yeah. constitutes Bluetooth, life? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, is it self-awareness? Is it some biological element of it? Data was self-aware. Data mm -hmm. wasn't in any part biological. Yeah. You know, rational. Mm -hmm. You know, recall all these things that you would say would be synonymous with being a, a, a biological, intelligent biological entity. Data was, but data was by no means at all biological in the same way the puppet master is a ghost of a ghost. There's mm -hmm. not any biological function there. So yeah. does that yeah. constitute life or does that constitute a glitch that you could shut off, reboot? Which and is like, exactly what Section 6 says. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, is the idea that, you know, and I do love the fact that section, even in, within section six, they're clearly like, we don't know. Yeah. Like, some of us we're, think this, some of us think that. And in the end, we're just trying to kill it now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Bury the um, problem. <laughs> and it should be pointed out, it's one of the reasons why I kind of bounced off Ghost in the Shell a little bit, is that this is a very complex plot by sort of action movie standards, and there's a lot of sort of political maneuvering going on. So if you're not paying attention, like I found rewatching it, I was getting lost again. And oh wait, they did the thing, and then they're trying to get back at them. So it is easy to get lost in the, the sort of the complexity of who's screwing over who over the course <laughs> of this this story. Well, I think that was where Toonami, where it just it, mm. it I was it, in the deep end, where I was just like, oh, okay, yeah. because I can think of one episode where Aramaki is talking to the major mm. about something, and I, it could have been section six, I don't know. Yeah. But Ooh, there was no action. Oh, it yeah. Was literally mm -hmm. just them talking in his office, and then they had to go somewhere, and she was going with him while he was getting a car. Mm -hmm. And it, the, like the 10 minutes I watched, it's just talking. I'm mm -hmm. like, That's, hey, I don't oh, yeah. understand the, the politics That's going show. on here. That's good. Exactly. Exactly. Like, yeah, Ghost in the Shell is, is, you know, if you're looking for an action movie, Ghost in the Shell as a franchise, except for maybe the manga, mm. is not. Right. It's not, not an action thing. It's, mm. It really is, in a way, it's kind of like Dune in that, mm. you know, mm -hmm. the, the action gets lost in the political and the exposition and the mm -hmm. inner working. What the thing about the, the thing that, that appealed to me about the Ghost in the Shell was the fact that we're talking about internal machinations. Uh, we're talking about mm -hmm. people's thoughts and how it's interconnecting, and how the fact that in this world um, with computers, you know, it's not just us like now and today. You and we're all on Zoom and we're in, mm -hmm. in YouTube and doing this, and that's how we're getting connected. In this world, it's literally chunk mm -hmm. and you're connected. And there's so many different things. And the whole point about cyberpunk, by the way, is about the pitfalls of technology and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what you get out of this. Now, so you're not getting action out of this. You're getting thought. Mm -hmm. You're getting philosophy. You're getting, mm -hmm. you know, um, intricacies of, like, one of the things, the Aramaki superpower, if you want to call it that, <laughs> in this in in the franchise is his ability to actually work within the government and get what he wants. Mm -hmm. You know, there's protect section nine, uh, protect section yeah. nine, mm -hmm. to use uh, to use section nine towards his own ends because Aramaki does have an agenda. Oh yeah, yeah, he mm -hmm. definitely has an agenda, and he in 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 a very real sense, he himself is a puppet master, but mm -hmm. organically. So I mean, mm -hmm. he's just. But you have to follow that, yeah. so you have those t those expositions like like on the boat, or when they're mm -hmm. in the elevator and mm -hmm. they're talking, and and then as you're saying, pointing out 
here's the pointer. <laughs> yeah, you know, here's here's what you need to understand, mm -hmm. you the audience, and then we're going to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so you get these long exposition scenes, exposition scenes, and then you get into why one of the reasons why I love Tobisa so much mm -hmm. in this franchise is that he's the action guy. He's yeah. the least cybernetic person, but yeah. he's the most active. Yeah, I, I was. I'm glad you said that because I actually wrote down on here. I think Togusa is like one of the most proactive characters in the entire movie, because yeah. um, he's constantly just following up on things. I love the scene with him in the, uh, in, the uh, in the garage where he's like, "Yeah, hmm, hmm, this doesn't, doesn't yeah. quite add up," and just <laughs> yeah. following up things. Um, well, like it too when they're when they're driving, and the yeah. major just is like. I'll drive and just leads back and gets plugged in. And he's, he's like, whoa. He's like, whoa. Yeah, he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and like, but there, she doesn't have, you know what I mean? It's, it's not like, hey, hold on a second. You know, she reassures mm, him and doesn't. She's nope. like, nope, let me drive. Hooks yep. in and, he, and he's the only one who's reacting to that. And I, it's, it's one of the really, um, you know, clever things about the movie is, is how much they sort of communicate about section nine throughout the course of the, the movie to give you these, this kind of idea of, of, of what this, this group is. I mean, A, you have this clearly very high level, the opening scene, very high level, um, you know, asylum seeking thing. And the major just blows a guy's head off and disappears. Like, obviously you are operating at a very high level. There's also stuff like near the end um, when, um, uh, when the major is trying to rip the the, the, the tanks the hatch off, off. Yeah. Oh. yeah um and um fails basically and is, is about to get get destroyed um and Bato comes in and, and hits it and and goes sorry I'm late I had to go and grab this and you realize he you know she called in for backup maybe 30 seconds ago right and he's late. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. the that that's the sort of you know pacing at which section nine operates. You know, it's yeah. like jeez. Well, you figure for all those that are cybernetically enhanced. I mean, they're. I'm assuming somewhere in there it's not said, but she can track and trace everything on a map, mm -hmm. as she says. You know, she likes yep. she being way she is. She's wired into everything, instantaneous yep. access. Obviously, Bato is wired in as well, so I'm sure he could see. Understand yeah, was sure. a threat assessment, and he's like calculated his ETA mm -hmm. and to get the equipment mm -hmm. that he needs because he didn't just show up and go nine millimeter, nine millimeter. <laughs> huh, that's not working. He up. No, he mm. brings a freaking land cannon. Yeah. cannon <laughs> you know? So he obviously has been wired into what's going on with the major. Totally. Mm -hmm. I I think just that process of trying to open the hatch. Where all of this, of just everything's coming apart. All and the muscles, like, yeah. Wow, mm -hmm. like that's that, that's, that's a level of detail amazing. that that, that yeah. of animation yeah. that was that is. Well, I even, wish it wasn't. I wish you could show that more, but right, because yeah, but, but, yeah. but because you know you're showing breasts mm -hmm. or more to the point. Well, the the first part where we yeah. we get to see the major, the guy she splats. You get to see his his spinal cord and a little bit of his ribs, ribs in that, yeah. in that yep. split second where it's just like, wow, that's a little bit yeah. more gross anatomy than I was expecting. I did, I did an AMV once, and I had that scene in there towards the beginning of it, and mm. it was I think it was on a guitar riff. And as you know, you know, people who don't know the movie, they're watching this, and they're like, oh, okay, what's this? Oh my god, his head blew up. You know, mm. like the whole reaction of the audience was just like, oh, oh. And you're oh. using Metallica's Master oh, of Puppets as the, yeah. as the music, right? <laughs> no. And, and, you know, let's mention that, that, you know, because I love looking at the opening moments of a movie or t TV series to see what they're establishing. You know, you have A, talky, talky, talky. Okay, that tells us something. But also, nude woman, guy's head explodes. This is not shonen. No. <laughs> you know, you, you're very clearly being told what kind of movie you're in for. I wonder if Goblin no. Slayer took a took a yeah. lesson from this as to how yeah. to just punch your audience in the eyeballs <laughs> and then roll it forward, people. Yeah, perhaps the yeah, wrong um, lesson because yeah. on a on a side note, mm. um, if you listen closely, now there is an English um, narration that's happening over the Japanese at this point at, mm. at the beginning mm. of the uh, at the beginning of the movie, right? And if you're Dominion Tank Police, you recognize the name of the city, which is Newport. 
Oh, nice. Newport, yeah, Newport's a uh, um, reference back to Dominion mm-hmm. Tech Police. Just mm-hmm. good sign. Of the oh, yeah. yeah. But I um, thought it because somebody was from Newport, Rhode Island. <laughs> Uh, what's happening in Newport? The section nine has to be there. Mm-hmm. But one of my favorite scenes in that part of the in the beginning of the movie is as she's dropping down and the CGI effect, which is taken in just so lovingly done, mm-hmm. where she disappears, where she's got the optical mm-hmm. suit on. Or yeah, mm-hmm. suit on, but she's she's optical optical camo. The, and one of the few moments in this movie where she shows some level of humanity, of flirtiness, of mm-hmm. Of being, you know, snarky, whatever. She does the veil with her hands. And yeah. Think, yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Mm. See ya. Well, it's one of the things I liked in general about the movie, which they they um, something that I I think is portrayed more effectively in other versions of Ghost in the Shell that the movie just doesn't have time mm-hmm. for, is the fact that the major does have this snark to her. Um, you know, the first thing, and this is something that is different in the Japanese versus the English version just because of manga entertainment, British company, they don't want to, you know, right. do things. But, like, when uh, the major signs off for the first time, or no, she, 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 has, she has kind of a glitch, and Bato asks, what's going on? And she goes, must be my time of the month, and, you know, switches oh, off. No, it, no, it's in this version. You know, it, it's, it's yeah. in Japanese, but it's not in the English dub. Oh, oh not in the English dub. Okay. Oh, I was yeah. going to say, I don't remember that part either. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Partly that is a joke because she can't do that, right? Like oh, she literally right. can't have that. Um, but also, it's just you know, she's obviously you know tweaking Bato's nose with that that statement. Yeah. Um, and so there is that kind of collegial, you know, joking between them. And such. Well, in one, one of the things I did notice when when the major was jumping on two things mm. is it's never addressed, <laughs> but the sheer fact that. This is not like a 120, 130 pound yeah. buff woman. No. Mm-hmm. This is like a 500 pound killer machine. Well, and so she lands at one point, now, it's like boom, and, and then she and, gets up. It's like, and, and again, remember they mentioned that because he's you know, like, uh, um, well, and, and they mentioned that, and also when um, uh, Togus is talking about the guys, oh, yeah, he goes, the you know, yeah. they're a thousand pounds. There's two, three of them, and it's like, wait, 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 like. 500 pounds is a potential one-person differential. Like, yeah. clearly, there's, you know, this thing's heavy. Well, and did Bato say that when they were scuba diving? Don't you ever worry about sinking to the bottom? Yeah! <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. like, uh-huh. Didn't really uh-huh. think that too much about, you know, the, the super heavy weight and that you still do need oxygen for the brain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, wow. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and so speaking of it, let's talk a little bit about uh, Bato and, and the Major. Um, Again, one of, one of the kind of fun things about the movie going on is how I think there's three, four times in the movie where Bato puts his his uh, coat, coat around Major Kusanagi, and she's standing there, you know, completely unfazed by this. He's like, no, 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 no yep. we're gonna we're gonna copy you. Yeah. Uh, and he's just that that little bit of Bato's you know relationship <clears throat> with Major. Clearly, he cares. Clearly, there's a little bit more going on. Um, well, and they were I just, on a boat together, so you could easily ship them. <laughs> well, and it's one of the things about that relationship, which again, I think it kind of goes on. Is you know, again, they're they're coworkers. Like it would be really awkward for that to go anywhere. And I think they mentioned that at some point in in Cinema and Complex, where they're they're like, just let's just not like let's just not complicate this by going in that direction. Like clearly, we like each other, but let's just not. Um, so they they depend on one another for their lives, lives. so yeah. it ne- wouldn't necessarily yeah. be a bad extension. But well, and also not, that's not where this is heading. Like, and the, also, in fairness, in the manga, like the Major yeah. Kusanagi has multiple lovers. Like, like she, she gets around. <laughs> yeah. So so out there in J- uh, chat land, just to just to mm. let you guys know the differences. Uh, one, that's one of the big differences between the manga, the series, and, and the movies. Mm-hmm. In the movies, the, the major is specifically, you know, she does this on, on purpose. Um, makes her cold, her her humanity cold. Mm-hmm. In the manga here, oh no, mm. oh no, she's all over the map, mm. literally. Yeah. And there's actually one scene in the manga that is actually in the first season of Zack mm. when when she um, in, in the series she's in the the kind of the hotel room and these two women come yep. in and she 
on Jackson. She says, sorry, I have to go to work. And they're just like, and the two girls are like, oh. Mm-hmm. And then in the manga, they actually show. Oh, it, it goes a little further. Well, yeah. Yeah. it depends on which version of the manga you have, because oh. I actually have the ver- the original release of, of this in the U.S., where they went to um, Shiro and said, I'm sorry, we can't be that explicit with manga in, in America, so would you mind cutting that out? So there's one page missing from this manga, and I'll see if I can show it here. Oh, find it. not in here. I've, I've um, got yeah, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a big difference. It is a, it's a full color. There it is. Um, yeah. And so I think, yeah, so it, it is literally, a little, I, can, I mean, it's a very... It's this is Major Kusanagi sort of diving jumping, down, yeah. jumping in to be with her, be with them, and then they're just kind of then she just wakes up basically, right? Uh, and, and, and there's an, an entire oh, yeah. page there that is is in this one which I cannot show you. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. She, no, she, no. I, I would get in trouble. If she I was an adult, right? Um, so. Yeah. And but, but she is much more sexualized mm-hmm. in in the manga and in the series. You learn that she is a sexual person, but not oh, yeah. not like hmm. not like this. Mm-hmm. And in the movie, she. But that's her, there's a point to it in the yeah. movie, like when they like in the very beginning of the construction scene when her body's been constructed. Mm-hmm. Right. There's a yeah. reason why you don't see anything. Right, and that's something that, that she kind of establishes is that she is you know that she is non-functional in that that sense, um, but not in other versions of, of the game. Right. Yeah. Um, which ends again. It's kind of kind of that thing. Um, Which I mean, I, again, I'd like to see the Bato and her and the major, you know, ship, but mm. that you know, that's not really super it, necessary to get into the nitty gritty exactly of what's right. going on. It's it's like, it's, it's not inferred the storyline. Yeah, <laughs> there, and there, there's there's one scene in in the series where it's inferred, but mm, yeah. And in fairness, you know, from a dramatic perspective, it's like any anime, right? Like. As yeah. soon as you cross that line, it completely changes the relationship, and it's kind of more fun right. to watch Bato be like, uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, mm, I can't really say my thing, I'm actually 14. Um, to, to answer the question in the chat, um, um, the Major's age is kind of an interesting question. Um, every version of Ghost in the Shell addresses that differently, because she could kind of be as old, she could be, she could be any age, um, right. You know, there, there's it's just data, so they can just give her a new body all the time. Um, and in the movie, I don't think they ever get into it. She's just an adult woman. They don't. They don't get into the movie for. It, Brent, you got it right. It's it's just it depends on what you're reading, what you're watching. Right. But generally speaking, but the interesting thing is that one thing that does spread through some of the mm. series in the manga is when Bato. It's kind of like almost a running gag when Bato has to replace her body. He does so in different <laughs> ways, in different. You know, he does it multiple times Sorry. in multiple storytellings. Mm-hmm. Oh, but, but each time, and, and this. by the way, he gets it wrong each time. Yep. Mm-hmm. But there's one manga series that was written where he does it, and he thinks that he's getting a female body, but it's a really an, an effeminate oh, male Oh, that's in the manga. Uh, yeah, that's right. I wanted that's to pull that out, yeah. And, he, he, and, but, 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 she, but she, he goes, oh, I'm, you know, he's basically saying, I'm sorry, but she goes, it's okay, let's try this out for a while. And one of the things that you oh my. get in throughout the different series is, is that not only do you not know how old she is, you kind of don't know what her original gender is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's an interesting yeah. twist. Right. Okay. Yeah. She, she just is an individual. She just, and in the movie, and the reason why that's such a, like a big deal in the movie is that, you know, when they're doing the construction scenes, they they they, they don't give an a, a explanation as to why they're making her female. Mm-hmm. There's no exposition on that. But she's right. female. But there's nothing there that she can do with the body, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so she's definitely a woman, but there's no femininity there's no mm. there's you know you know uh, there's no outwardly you know any feminist type of thing there's no non-feminist type of thing she just mm. is mm. and right. that's kind of the whole point of the movie is what are you and well, she's having and she's kind of having problems with that processing that through the movie and that's where the ghost comes in and and to the point we talked about earlier about Aramaki being sort of a, a, a puppet master himself is that 
that kind of has hints on that. You'll, you'll notice that you, you have this little bank of, uh, of android girls um, yeah, who yeah. are all of these, these, you know, um, identical ponytailed 25-year-old um, androids. Uh, and they're all androids, by the way. Um, so, by the way, um, that is also a Dominion Tank Police reference. Right. Um, that is a character oh. in Dominion Tank Police. And Please. Shiro just yeah. loved the character design and just enjoyed drawing over. the girl and brought it over. <laughs> and then nice. sort of retconned that Aramaki also just kind of has a thing for that, you know, that android model. And so he's like, I run a division of the government. I can just order five of these, you know, and that's just what he does. Literally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no um, but it, it does kind of get into some of these, these interesting things of, you can imagine a Section 9 that says, we want... You know, a section nine that contains this mix of male female. So if this character goes undercover in this situation or in this this situation, we have these sort of assets and these different things for different different people. You know, if we want to be able to, you know, have somebody seduce a heterosexual male, we need women on the. You know, we need female bodies on the force, um, and it gets into all sorts of elements about. Well, what does that? You know, okay. You know, right. what, does, what does that mean? Um, so yeah, it, it is. It's an interesting aspect around around just kind of. You can kind of be anything. So what does that make you, right. if anything? Um, and I guess a lot of the, the themes, the, the the kind of symbolism that we see over and over and over in the movie. Obviously, dolls and mannequins show up all over the place in the movie. Um, again, in the manga, she just wakes up in this like adult rocker's body, which is long hair. Uh, and this is specifically like a, you know, a girl in this very like doll-like dress, um, you know, indicative of dolls. Um, uh, I also really, and I didn't notice this um, this time, is that when the major is doing that whole walk through the rain, um, yeah. where there's like nothing happening, she's just seeing all this this this, this imagery. Yeah, um, the the non-human things she sees gets less human as the scene continues. So she see, she sees like another version of her, like sitting at a cafe somewhere. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. And you know that could just be somebody else with the same body. Again, multiple copies of this body out there. Um, and then we, we see store mannequins, and the last thing we see is like a half mannequin, like just you know a torso basically. Yeah, um, Being faceless and just androgynous. Mm -hmm. Yep, and just we're just kind of you know, um, and, and it kind of mirrors presumably what's going through the, the major's mind of what am I? Am I just kind of this replaceable thing? Right. Um, and similarly, we get all the reflection of the water. Um, I actually noticed that, that, that scene where the, the terrorist is running away um, and he yeah. stops and we see the like, rivulets of water in there and I was like, oh, beautiful dreamer, or a Sayatara. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that little shot. He's sort of bring it, bring it forward to, to his audience. Say, hey, here's a, here's the thing. Remember that? If somebody fell into a puddle, I was gonna be like, no, exactly. No. Yes. Be like, no, no, uh, not doing this. Where's Lum? What's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, um, speaking Darling. of references, and and by the way, when, when I say he's pulling it, it forward, um, I watched a an interview with Nomura Oshii where he literally pointed at the scene. You know, a few shots later, where the major does that sort of spinning kick um, to take him right down, he points and he goes, "Virtua Fighter," and he goes, "I was playing a lot of Virtua Fighter at the time, and that was the finishing move of my favorite character in Virtua Fighter." Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Um, so he is not above putting things like that in his movies, right? Like that's not you know not crazy. Um, so you see that kind of stuff over and over again. You know, again, uh, uh, waters, reflections, characters seeing themselves in mirrors and in, in glass and so forth, um, which I think is granted. And again, I think it's one of those things. There's um, the Kuleshov effect, I think it's called, um, where uh, when w when those Russians were uh, doing um, early studies into film, and they found if you show a, a shot of like um, a meal and then some person's face, people will say that person's expression is hungry. And if they show, you know. A dead person, and then the same shot. People will say the person's expression is horror and whatever. And you know, whatever you show somebody, and you show somebody a face, people will sort of will take what they have seen in sequence and kind of apply that to the person's expression, as long as the expression isn't particularly strong. And right. because Ghost in the Shell has a lot of neutral faces, there's a lot of that projection going on in the movie. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there is a tendency of Oshi to throw a lot of symbolism and imagery into a movie without necessarily tying it together. The Basset Hound. Yeah. Yeah. This is a picture of my daughter. No, it's you and there your dog. Your mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> you know, like, and yep. then the dog's on the on the overpass. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and that's how you. That's when later on, when um, the puppet master, when they're talking, mm. and he talks about being so vastly created by the information and the network, and mm. how easy it is for for him, it she, to use data. Mm. She is literally seeing on the boat when she's looking up the basset hound, the guy's basset hound, mm. and you know you realize that that that's the basset hound because in the picture he's walking near a part, what looks mm. to be water, and a dog is on a leash mm. with a, but you don't quite see the woman. Yeah. And you realize that, that that that's the dog, that's the mm. dog. Mm-hmm. By the way, the dog comes back in uh, innocence. Oh yes, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That was a big thing in innocence. Uh, and Basset, uh, she uses Basset Hounds constantly. It's in Avalon, I think. It's in a bunch yeah. of movies. Um, and personally, I think the Basset Hound is one of those things that Oshi put put in, again, for kind of that symbolism, that imagery of, okay, here's a thing that I can implant in your head can also be in the real life. But I also, right. I think people, I've seen people, you know, write long essays about the exact meaning of the placement of the dog on the image and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not sure that Oshii means it that seriously. <laughs> I don't think, you know, I, I think he's putting in some of an imagery, but I don't, I don't think, you know, necessarily like subdividing things down into every individual line and what all that means is necessarily where he's going with all that stuff. Oshii loved Buster Brown shoes. They're really <laughs> fast <and> right. <laughs> he's into small hunting dogs with floppy ears, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. No, well, when, not they, really? when, when they're doing that entire sequence that I love, um, where it's just the boats going through mm. the city and, and you're you're being shown like very old things and new things converging mm, yeah. on each other. I mean, when you stop and think about it, she's riding on a boat and just above her is technology, mm. cars, you know, subways, helicopters, planes, they have all this different stuff going on. Meanwhile, down here, you got this rickety stuff going on Mm -hmm. you got piers you've got polluted water you got these boats that are acting as cabs moving around Mm -hmm. slowly so you just kind of feel like well it's with a connected electrical electrical wire wire above above (laughs) it like wow good choice electricity and water yeah and and been around a while and everything's kind of compacted but then Mm. there's this and as the rain goes you just kind of see her just observing again everything around her one of the scenes that strikes me is the kids with the yellow umbrellas Mm. you know the scene is just very static or Mm. you you know very very not interesting and then suddenly Mm. you see these kids running across there's nothing to it there's no meaning behind it it's just that's what's what's happening Mm -hmm. and you're just and you're just caught in this moment of being in in what appears to be um i think they said it is but it isn't hong kong but right yeah yeah it it is but it isn't Mm -hmm. and you know you just go through this whole scene and you're just like see and and to me just personally to me i think that's just the way of another point Mm -hmm. kind of pointy thing going this is what the world looks like yeah Mm-hmm. Simply, this yeah. is what the world looks like. Well, it's your little it's... slice of life to get your yeah. your background yeah. established. Speaking of which, I I just watched a whole thing on Nausicaa the Valley of Wind, and all of the stuff that is implied in the visuals of that movie about the technology and the way people live, and how Takahata really disliked the movie when it came out because of how it did not present these aspects of of real life. But that's a whole other thing, which I'll get into later. Wow. Uh, but it's fascinating. Because um, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Steve. And Oshii is a very visual storyteller. He likes presenting moments and giving you visuals be, to sink you into the world. Not necessarily because the, you know, those moments are there to reveal an important plot element or an important um, uh, you know, symbol or an important um, uh, concept of, of a character. It's to invest you further into what's going on. Uh, it's one of the powers of the movie. It's a, 
it, it's funny that Ghost in the Shell was so popular, especially in the West, and it introduced so many folks in the West to anime, because it's a very non-anime anime movie. Like, there's some very anime aspects to it, you know, jumping. Every anime character can jump 30 feet from a standstill. That's just established. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so we have those things, but then we also have these, you know, again, very non-expressive characters. Um, one thing I really noticed this time around and really appreciated is how characters stand and sit and walk in Ghost in the Shell. Mm -hmm. Like, when the characters of Section 9 are, are sitting around, they're, you know, doing this. They're doing this. It's very natural co-workers sitting around watching something. It's not, you know, anime characters sitting there doing the, the power pose while they're watching something or whatever. Right. Uh, you know. or, or that weird CGI thing where the arms can't seem to stop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's just kinetic motion to help you feel relaxed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, um, and, and it also gets to the point that, you know, uh, Ghost in the Shell was... It was made in, on a very compressed sort of time scale and budget, but you can tell how much thought went into thinking about, okay, how do these characters interact? How do they see each other? You know, what, how does all that, what does all that mean? And getting back to your, to your, your earlier point, I mean, one of the interesting things about this world is for being this near future cyberpunk thing, it is very relatable. Um, when they went to do the TV series, there's a great uh, quote from the director where he said, somebody came up to him early on in the writing process and said, so if somebody has matches in the world of Ghost in the Shell, would there be like a little circuit board in the match that would like tell you something about it? And because everything's like cyber and future, right? And the director looked at him and went, no, it's just a match. You just light it and it just goes off. Yeah. So they came up with this, this um, rule in their writer's room that never make, th th um, never make it look so futuristic that you don't know what a doorknob looks like. Right. Right. Like, like it's future, but it's not, you know, unrecognizable. And it, it's it's and you have that interesting sort of contrast between wooden boats <laughs> and right. jacked in, and and also um, to that point, I think the city is kind of its own antagonist in this movie. Um, the city is constantly presented with these hard lines, these harsh lines. Um, heck, you know that the city is what is being used against Section Nine when they're going trailing after the trash truck. Um, it is it is sort of this antagonist, very much in that cyberpunk you know element of here's all this technology. Is it necessarily a good thing for everything? Um, well, it's also nice to see that that you've got in a lot. You know, this is a movie versus an anime series, but in a lot mm -hmm. of anime series, the world is completely scrubbed clean. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> and like there there are points anime series that they want a dirty world. This is a dirty world. Yep, the guys there. in the garbage truck trying to feel under that phone, you're looking mm -hmm. at the underside of that phone, mm -hmm. and it's gross. Yep. I mean, everything around that, it's not a, a, a squeaky clean cybernetic future where little sweeper mm -hmm. robots come and grow <laughs> right, everywhere. Right. Yeah. Um, Astro Boy, this is not. Right. The garbage <laughs> truck, how much more old school do you want? Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Why right. wouldn't and, you have an automatic garbage? Nope. You got two dudes. Two dudes, right. Them. Old, now, now, old style garbage truck. Yeah, and they, you know they have a schedule to keep, and they're they're yeah. being timed and stuff like that. But one of the things that always makes me laugh when I watch this movie, especially living in a city like Baltimore, where I can look out my window on the alley here and actually do see that guy in the in the boxers and the wife beat <laughs> with the, with the garbage and going, I missed the truck. I missed the truck. <laughs> <laughs> can you take it to them? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, Dude, dude that's that's rim. it smells. It's like you know. Daycare in Calcutta. Please <laughs> help me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and it's also be pointed out, um, you know, uh, garbage collection has traditionally been a kind of unmentionable profession in Japan. Um, it was one of those things you didn't talk about. It was kind of taboo to kind of ref reference the those sorts of things like leather workers traditionally and so forth. Um, and so, even rep even presenting that in Ghost in the Shell is kind of shocking. Just that you have garbage collection as a thing on the screen. You have, name an anime series that you've seen that's, that's shown garbage collection. It's kind of not really a thing. Um, you've seen people fall into garbage. 
Definitely. You've seen people right. root through garbage. Chobits, for example, with Chi yeah, pulling yeah, her out yeah. of a trash pile and how Absolutely. horrible that was. Mm. Um, but, you, but yeah, I mean, you don't see garbage workers. You don't see, like, sewer workers. Mm -hmm. uh, in Clonad, mm -hmm. we were lucky to see somebody who was a, a blue-collar electric line worker. Ooh, mm -hmm. right. I mean, because you don't see that too yeah, often. That's, that's, that's not very common. Well, that was a, a very, um, to me, that was a very pointed way to move the, the, the obviously the plot along was that the puppet master was looking at like how can I do this under the radar remember he's using mm -hmm. an old was it they said HA23 whatever so some type of yeah. old style computer and he's looking for the, the least noticeable way to mm -hmm. go, go about things so what's the least noticeable thing that you're going to do you're going to go with the garbage guys because nobody's really looking at them yeah, and and the only way, and it's kind of interesting when they're finally figured out that it's the garbage guy. They're like, the only way they could figure it out was because the guy in the wife beater came out. Yeah, no hmm. technology, no technology at all on that. They just came out, and just said, "Oh yeah, I missed the guy who was just here," and they're just like, "Uh," mm -hmm. and that's how they pieced it together. Yep, and, and, and they went. And, right. again, and again, you know, gotta love Oshii's little cinematography of there where the guy's going, you know, yeah, trash guys came there. Cut to peeling tires, cars <laughs> turning around, <laughs> flying, you know. <laughs> Conversation's over, moving on. No, no, no thank you. Just yeah, that wasn't even a thank you. <laughs> Come on. But, uh, yeah, again, very cinematic. Very, mm. yeah. um, very action filmy. Mm -hmm. One of the few action things, which uh, yeah. the gun designs in this movie are just insane. On how, how based, how well they're based on um, real life. Mm -hmm. uh, and There's a Mrs. Fields logo in this movie. I saw this, yeah. this time. When they're, when, they're, yeah. when they're going through like the, the sort of Kowloon area, one of the yeah. signs is, yeah. it is, and not just like the words Mrs. Fields, it is the Mrs. Fields cookies logo. It's like, wow, dang. Yeah. And they, they, Purposely misspell it, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. FEIL or something like that. But yeah, it's, it's <laughs> they, weird. they could have just done the Steins Gate and asked for you know sponsorship <laughs> money. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Come on, wouldn't be surprised. Well, they had all that non entertainment Pepper. money, you know. Yeah, oh yeah, um, which roll it in it. Which worth bringing out. Um, you know, um, one of the interesting things about the movie, sort of from a production perspective, is that manga entertainment the American licensor was one of the financiers of this movie. Like, it's in the opening credits. Oh, right. Manga Entertainment. Um, which is one of the reasons why they're the only ones who license it, because, like, we made it! Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, like, this was at a time when, you know, there was significant money flowing across from North America to, to Japan to, to pay for this stuff. Um, and you see that, I think, too, in, you know, there's, I, I do think there is a little bit, I'd, I'd love to sort of dive in. Oshii has never, has, I believe he said that he never explicitly made this, like, for Americans consciously. Um, you know, where he, he wasn't like, oh, this is going to be shown in America, so we've got to make sure it's, you know, it, it, it appeals. But, like, you see those, that, that, those opening helicopters and the opening shot and the city, and you can't help but think of Blade Runner, Right. right. Um, and there's just, there are certain elements where, again, I don't think it's conscious, but I do wonder if there are certain things that can kind of, kind of make it a little more easy to recognize for the American audience. Well, there was pushback on the way that Oshi made the movie. Oh, was there? there was, uh, yeah, there was pushback. Okay. They, they um, when, when, as production was going on, they wanted more action. Mm. Um, because that, that's how they wanted to sell the movie. They wanted to sell right. the movie as an action movie, but, you know... In my way of thinking, that it was, then you should never have hired Oshi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did you see you're not Angel's gonna Egg? Get that. You're not yeah. gonna get that. Just saying. Yeah. Um, but you got this. But but you got this other thing. And speaking to that, to the opening scenes in the helicopters and some mm. of the scenes where it grows quiet before the actual action starts, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of you see a little pat labor in there with mm -hmm. the 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 multi level schematics CGI's that yeah. you see mm -hmm. uh, from the from the first Pat Labor movie but mm -hmm. you also see you know as, as you're saying the Blade Runner stuff the, the kind of the when he's going through the city and all the lights there's one particular one uh, scene where it's just the it's just black and white or I'm sorry mm -hmm. it's black and green and the helicopter is countered 
mm-hmm. and yeah, you know, yeah. it's just going around. And that's really CGI all you see. Is, and, you know, building. Yeah, and, CGI yeah. of the building, but that's all you really see, and mm-hmm. and that's the moment where I, my, my the memory kicks in of Blade Runner, and I keep expecting to hear the woman from Blade Runner going, "Oh, dang, you know, <laughs> saying her, yeah, you know, th- saying your mm-hmm. thing as, as the helicopter's going through, but it's very quiet. Like Ishikawa, who has barely a role in this mm-hmm. movie. Is, is there and he's kind of you know gives a little bit of exposition of what's going on mm-hmm. um, and there's you don't never see Saito but he is mentioned true um, and, and in there but it's very quiet even when they're setting up the sniper's nest they mm-hmm. set up the, the yep. barriers everything is rainy but quiet and mm-hmm. then everything happens yep yeah um, and you're absolutely right you know <laughs> um, Oshi is not really an action director he can do action extremely well but he doesn't like really make action movies right um absolutely um, he's no michael bay that's for sure this is this is very true um <laughs> although like let's talk Sorry, about Steve. that <laughs> yeah you almost got a spit take there. <laughs> <laughs> um let's talk about that that final sequence you know which is widely considered to be one of the great action movie sequences of all time um of the major versus the uh, the tank um, yeah. And how wonderfully they set that up. Because, yeah, you have all this silence. You have all this stuff. You see the Major breaking in. And the Major knows it's not just a car, right? Like, she knows there's more going on than just a car. Yeah. And then she sees the tank, and there's that wonderful, oh, great. Okay. Yeah. What now? And I do like the fact that you, you do have this, this sort of time when she's waiting, and you realize she's not just sitting there. She's thinking through options. And she's going through all these different things she could possibly do. Um, and I noticed this, this time around, I don't know if I did it the last time. Because um, I remember watching this sequence and seeing her, you know, she, because Bato says, you, you have nothing that can dent this. Yeah. And yet she's still hopping around corners, firing guns at it, and then running away. And then, you know, she finally jumps up on the you know, anime jump. Um, up onto that platform, and she goes, finally the ammunition has run out. And you realize, oh, Oops. she's faster than a tank, yeah. right? She can outrun a tank, because tanks aren't designed to, you know, track a person. Yeah. So she is, she is um, distracting it, getting it to just churn through all of its bullets, so that then she can, you know, anime jump, uh, and get onto it. And it's one of those Thank you, Oshii, for not telling us that um, and giving us this lovely action sequence all the way through where you have this thing of you know, trading gunfire in a way that feels tense despite the fact that it's not person versus person. Right. Yeah, the, the whole when she's... By the way, folks, if you happen to hear voices <clears throat> um, coming in through the feed, no, it's not a ghost in the shell. It's... True love happening in the alleyway. Oh, good. Me. Mm. So you know, I'm, I'm expecting a gunshot here pretty soon. Okay. Oh. Um, <laughs> wow. Mm. No, just just a bunch of people yelling and yelling in the alley. Mm. It's the city life. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. New Year. <laughs> um, no, that I love that. That's another scene that I really love throughout this whole thing. Is that is that this one action scene is just is amazing because you're right. You're going through. She's going through the options. But she's not talking. Mm-hmm. The most you get is Bato saying, "You don't have the equipment to do this." Mm-hmm. So she's going through it. She's opening up the case and she's looking through it. And she pulls out the FN two hundred nine, and she opens it up, and there's this totally unneeded but wonderful ten second sequence of her rejiggering the uh, doing a mod mm-hmm. on the gun on the yeah. fly. I mean, that's just amazing. (laughs) Doing a mod on the gun with a tank right behind you, right? Mm -hmm. So she's doing a mod on the gun so that she can do more effective firepower. What she's doing is that she's making sure that she can inject the barrel when it gets hot. Yeah. Uh, And uh, that's so when you see the scene of her doing this Mm -hmm. and something falls out, that's actually the barrel coming out. That's that's one of the reasons why I say the gun design in in this Mm -hmm. movie is just weird, weirdly accurate. (laughs) And, and, um, by the way, Togusa's gun is a real gun. Oh, cool! It exists. It nice, exists yeah. in real life. Cool. Um, it's it's called a Metzva. Hmm. It's uh, it's made by Italians. Yeah. Um, hmm. I could go on forever about why it's constructed the way it is. <laughs> anyway, but uh, but more to the anime. Um, so you know when she's running around and, and and she's trying to draw the fire, 
she takes out one of the one of the gatlings on the tank, mm-hmm. and so she's able to. That's that was her goal of re, of doing the mod is to take mm-hmm. out the one gat. She's trying actually to take that gatling out, and she's trying to take out what she can, which is the guy in the car. Mm-hmm. And as so she's going around, then you have that wonderful scene where it's just tracing her as she moves. And yeah. do you recognize from the angel's egg? The, the fossil on the wall. Yes. You oh. recognize the, when it the tree away, of life. Tree yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It goes and stops it on it. Mm-hmm. Yep. It stops it on it. You, and so that's the yep. great moment. moment. Uh, also, <laughs> I thought the fossils, I'm like, wait a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the fact that, you know, where does it end up? By the sea. You know, the primordial soup, the soup from which yep. life arises. Like very, mm, you know, He's thinking this through. Um, yeah, and then and, and again, like, like you say, you know, you have this lovely gunshot thing, um, and then it c- kind of culminates in this amazingly animated sequence of the ma- all those all the majors, basically the majors' body getting pulled beyond, yeah, be, be beyond its its, yeah. its 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 possibilities. In fact, I think I can. Let's see if I can find this image in the uh, in the manga because he actually talks about that in the manga. Um, one of the downsides of cyborgization, I don't think it's here, because um, um, he, he has a whole bunch of notes. No, it's a, I think a separate thing um, about cyborgization in um, uh, and what it can or can't do to you. Because the problem is, let's say um, you have a cyborg arm. And just a, you know, a cyborg arm on your, your regular body, all grafted on, it all works, it's all fine. And then you try to contract that arm at you know, 500 you know, pounds or whatever. Guess what happens? It rips out of your body. Here's itself off. Because <laughs> yeah. your body can't take that. Um, and so it's one of the reasons in Ghost in the Shell is you don't see a lot of half cyborgs, especially in major you know, um, situations, because it just doesn't really work. Um, and that's why you see the designs in, in other anime of mm. why they're so, like, some of the, like, the cyborgs like like them are not obvious cyborgs. Unless, right. you know, like, when you look, unless you, Batao didn't have his, his button eyes, you wouldn't yeah. know he was a cyborg. You wouldn't know mm-hmm. that the major right off bat that, they, that they were cyborgs. But in the series and other places, you see how they're, like, so almost steampunkish, like mm, mm. design and big and awkward and things for that purpose because it, it really does follow the physics. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of like Gundam in that way and says, mm. "Here's the reality of the universe." Yeah, so right. we're not going to mess with that rule. And it's what makes that sequence, I think, so powerful is that you realize she is pushing every system in her body past the limit. Yep. You know, yeah. if she can do all that stuff and all of it is breaking apart, you know that, A, um, this is a really powerful tank, and B, like, she's desperate. Yeah. yeah. And that's great drama, is is pushing your character past their limits where she's doing what she does. And it should be pointed out, she fails. Right. And there's a great scene where you realize, oh, cyborgs can die because the mm-hmm. arm comes down. Mm-hmm. And starts putting stress on the brain. on the head on the head like like her her visor just pops yep. off you know yep and then Bounto comes to save the day with his quick oh let me just get this can opener <laughs> <over here." laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's really cool seeing how all these things come together um, I also do appreciate just kind of the pacing of that final sequence um, where again it, it does get very slow and very kind of I won't say dull, but dull. Metho- uh, methodical. It's a there quick transition from going, oh, and then mm-hmm. and then Bato like hooks him up, and you're like, oh, 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 talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. And then I want to talk to talking um, again. Huh? <laughs> but 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 again, I, I I do appreciate that you know um, Oshi knows what he's doing, and so he adds extra drama of the snipers coming in, um, and that that lovely moment of. Um, where they're coming in, and uh, I, I, again, little snark, um, where the major's like, why should I, you know, why should I merge with you? What do I get out of the deal? And he goes, I don't think you appreciate quite everything I can do. Whereupon all the snipers get shut down, you know, and, and the puppet's <laughs> is like, I know, and no, you are not doing that. 
done. Uh, and you realize, oh yeah, like that's that's handy. Like like good good job. That's well done. You know, I'm a universal uh, remote control. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> much. Yeah. Bloop, bloop. They're all done. <laughs> mm. I will say um, w w one of the w probably the, the the one other big thing I want to mention is, um, and this is not a, a big complaint, but I do think that the speaking of the puppet master and and. You know, being born in, a, in in this vast sea of information, there is a slightly quaint awe of the internet in Ghost in the Shell. Um, you know, everyone speaks of of the net as this vast sea of possibility that is the next stage of human evolution, and that you know we're we're gonna just create all sorts of amazing things in the internet. It's like, yeah, it hasn't quite turned out that way. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we're only eight years away from 2020. It's true. So, yes, yeah, so we have. We, so it could it could happen? It could, it could but did Oshie not happen. walk clean? I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. You know what I mean? It, yeah, it's, it's not a super uh, groovy connected future necessarily. No, it, it's it's <laughs> like you know, adult sites and and megalomaniacs. It's kind of annoying. Um, that's a disturbingly Influencers. accurate They're called influencers. Of, yeah, there we go. Egomania wow. Influencers. Wow. That's really depressing. Anyway. Um, <laughs> the puppet masters of Pepsi influencers. Yeah, exactly. All Pepsi. <laughs> nice. Nice. Oh. Um, when you see what, uh, what um, uh, Standalone Complex does with uh, laughing man and all that good. anyway um, but yeah it's 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 impressive that a movie made in the well made in the early 90s um, came out in the mid 90s um, holds up so well in the modern day despite being this cyberpunk near future story there's a lot of cyberpunk that hasn't aged well um, yeah. and this this feels um, still prescient and relevant as again, as kind of obvious it can be at times, kind of preaching at you. Um, I think it, it it does still feel like it is tackling topics that are still relevant and are, are still interesting in an entertaining visual way. Yeah. The the whole you know the whole point of the the movie just saying, who am I? Am I am I life? How do I go forward in life? The puppet master is you know has one of those things where it's just like i'm basically immortal so i can't really be a life form <clears throat> unless i die so he's allowing himself to die mm -hmm. remember he switches the major and himself mm -hmm. and, you know and then switches switches them back between the bodies and um <clears throat> but you know one of the things he talks about is is replication and they mm -hmm. talk about you know, she goes, well, you just make a copy of yourself. And he says, like, no, there's no diversity in that. That's mm -hmm. why I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. Because you're, right now, what's unsaid is that the major is, one. Of, he says, one of a kind. Meaning that she has, mm -hmm. she's more connected to things like he is than mm -hmm. anyone else. And that may be why she doesn't have that humanity. He's questing the humanity she doesn't know that she is human or needs it even needs mm -hmm. it that's one of the arguments that she was having in the elevator with with Bato saying you know what's the point you know <laughs> you know kind of and he's basically offering you know when they have the conversation and she goes okay what do I get out of it and he's just like you get everything you know mm -hmm. you get everything and you're able to then go into the computer anytime you die you're going to spread out what you are and then mm -hmm. something else is going to hook on to it and that's going to create this new life the new ghosts mm -hmm. and so that's what he wants he wants a legacy but he understands that he has to die and by the way mm -hmm. when they use the gender that's because they have that yeah, exactly. five minute explanation <laughs> why they call him mm -hmm. yeah. um but you know he's 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 just like you know you know he doesn't have really any bad feeling about dying you know it's not like mm -hmm. I want the full experience he's just he just understands that if you want to be a life form you have to go through this cycle mm -hmm. or that's what Oshi is trying to tell you is that yeah to in order to be life you have to go through the cycle and mm -hmm. you will live on in a different form 
and variety mm-hmm. and, and push on and your goal the, the goal of man is is to move into the future by spreading yourself out as much as this sounds horrible spreading yourself out as much as possible mm-hmm. but um but the idea is through your genes you know mm-hmm. you, you know if you have well, three kids then the tree of life the, yeah, yeah final yeah. fight mm-hmm. scene the fossils right. on the wall of you yeah. know evolution of forms yeah. again not necessarily subtle right <laughs> <laughs> But it's it's and that's what you know makes the movie not an action movie is that it's mm-hmm. really not you know th- there's action in it but there's it's really about trying to figure out what this thing is and the fact that oh and this is this is one of those times where you figure out the Americans are not the good guys yeah true and mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in, in the franchise the Americans are never the good guys no. um, and you you kind of get that idea and like you said earlier you know they they're just like oh we made this thing and uh, crap! Something yeah. happened, and mm-hmm. we tried to isolate it and kill it. And uh, Section I can you help us out. Mm-hmm. 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 But uh, but yeah, it's just yeah. you know just this is the whole life thing, and then the whole life thing. What the whole life thing. The whole, the whole life, life thing. thing. Wow. Whole life cycle. But then it ends. The movie ends on a note where she's a doll. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he saved the head right <laughs> little macabre there right yeah save the head and he goes well it's the black market and, and this is what i could get with the money i had in my oh. pocket <laughs> and, this, and, he's just, and, and and she's and, and she's just like looking at her body and she's just like going okay you gotta explain this to me <laughs> right you know you well, gotta everybody has a goth this. lolly doll you know, later, right? Right? <laughs> right you know what, what's what's going on but then you see more of the of the uh, him and her, you know, the relationship, professional mm-hmm. relationship, and also personal relationship. And then it ends with her saying, "No, I'm not the major anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm part of the major, and I'm part of this. Mm-hmm. So I'm something different, and I'm going to have to go out in the world and figure it out." And let's point out, just going to get back to the, the early point in that scene, Bato's reaction, where he's like, "Oh, I lost." Yeah, you know. Like, oh, she's 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 done the deed, effectively, you know, with a puppet master, and all right, well, mm, you know. Yeah. Oh, darn. Yeah. Yeah, and he was just like, well, the keys aren't in your front left pocket, and at which point that's when, like, you know, the, the, the rational part of your mind that lives in the normal world that kind of goes, wait, a 12-year-old driving a car? <laughs> no one's going to pull her over? <laughs> Well, in that world, and that's another thing. Again, in this world, you know, you can just go. Well, actually, here's my ID. You know, oh, you're just swapped into. Oh, you're 102. Okay, got mm-hmm. it. And you're doing the goth yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. Right. No questions asked. Yeah, I would what, what's she the jacked in the driving, the first time that when she hopped in the car, she mm-hmm. jacks into that. Probably it authenticates your ID and your age. And your, you know, mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. Off. What's the uh, uh, Jameson, the, the CEO in uh, San Leonardo Complex? It's just a little like box with like spider legs. Yes, um, and, and he's, he's, and, he's and he's with with a little flag, Japanese flag. <laughs> a dude from Texas with a Texas accent. Going, I love Japan. I want to be a robot. And he's, it's just like, what? yeah, he, wow. he's he's basically just a, a brain in a box who, who, who runs around. Box. Yeah, it's like like a, like a, an <laughs> aluminum box. And he, he talks at some point about how it's more convenient. Like I'm just this little you know one foot thing. I can go all over the place and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's very much playing. Actually, actually, um, it turns out, just to go way off reservation, um, that is a reference to an extraordinarily early science fiction movie, a uh, science fiction um, short story. Um, like, we're talking Lensman era, like, very early science fiction story. Well, I thought um, you were going to say, they saved Hitler's brain. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. And it's about, like, this, it's about wow. like, like, the first human, like, goes off to the stars and, you know, goes through a wormhole, whatever, and, like, his ship is badly damaged. And so aliens find him, and his body is completely deteriorated, so they just put his brain in a box and give him, like, tentacles and, and things. And he goes off on adventures as, like, a brain in a box doing things. And so that's, like, a, a callback to this weird old science fiction story. That is the level of geekery you get in Ghost in the Shell, by the way. Is you know wow. when, when folks make Ghost in the Shell, like they they, they know they, they go crazy. Yeah. Well, there's an H.P. Lovecraft story that's that mm. as well, where the fungi from Yugath are mm. mining in like New Hampshire, mm. and people who find their uh, operation, they will either kill them off 
or they will remove their brains and place them in cylinders and then take them back to their planet. Wow. And there's a point where the protagonist, you know, discovers what's going on and somebody's talking to him in this darkened room and he thinks he sees him sitting in a chair, mm. but then it's revealed it's the cylinder with this odd like mechanical setup that allows it to mm. hear and see and speak. Mm-hmm. And it's just like yeah. <laughs> but they needed to remove the brain because the body could not survive the interstellar travel. Ah, uh, gotcha. Like, uh, yeah. So that's that's pre nineteen thirty seven HP Lovecraft right yeah, there. There we go. You know? Um turns out they were thinking back then. Um, about a lot of things, um, but yeah, and it's and, and again, it kind of gets back to the themes of the movie of of okay, does it matter? Like you need two arms, two legs. It's just you know, it's, it's a body. Um, now, the, the, it, actually, getting back to that scene you mentioned earlier, um, it, it is a little later, so I can I can delve into slightly more adult topics. Um, so the scene that's removed in, in the scene that's removed from the manga. Um, the the major is let's just say very much enjoying herself, um, whereupon um, Bato needs to talk to her, so he brain dives into her. Oh, in the middle of that, yeah, and he just goes, oh jeez, like I don't I'm even sorry, have I'm that. Sorry, sorry, like what's like, what, how what is, what does that feel like? Like this doesn't make any sense. So, so like the panel of the manga is is Bato going. Oh no 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 no! no, 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 no. I'm so sorry. I'm so so sorry. And so the the major just. Brady packs him and says, "Yeah, next time, knock." Yeah, basically, just duke. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But one of the things they they point out in the scene is that Bato doesn't have the um, the mental circuitry to interpret the signals that he is getting from the major's body. Right. Right. She has completely different, you know, physical elements that are sending certain signals. His brain just can't interpret. So right. it's a very disorienting feeling, besides just being like, Ugh. Um, and it's one of the things about about this world is that you have these weird incompatibilities between things, which gets back to something that I I, I realized was mentioned from the puppet past. Is he's like, I sought you, he, I sought you out, major, and I realized, you know, if you are looking for somebody to fuse with, it's not probably a good idea to choose just any person off the street. You want somebody with some basic compatibility. And so he's looking for somebody who is not just skilled, not just intelligent, but somebody who is kind of simpatico. Um, and who also, again, similar body, similar physical, like, you know, the manufacturer. Um, and I was like, oh, that's, that's clever that they actually, you know, um, tied that string together to say, you know, you don't just do this randomly, you know, in other words, isn't it convenient that the bad guy who wants to do this chooses our hero? Yeah, well, no, they actually made that work. Well, you know, and they, they allude to that in the, in the beginning when they when you discover how badly the people who are taken over by the puppet master are, are yeah. changed. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the guy who thought that he had a kid and a wife who's divorcing him, and it's really yeah. just his, him and his dog uh, who's been living in the same mm-hmm. crappy apartment for 10 years. And he starts crying because he doesn't want these memories because they're all, they're hard they're hard memories but it's what the puppet master wanted him to think so to be able to, to get through what he needed the guy to do mm-hmm. and the guy says can I get rid of these memories and Tokusa says I'm sorry we we just don't have the technology to really be able to do that mm-hmm. and then there's the guy the scene where she you know you know fights uh, the gunman out in the middle of that that water area and Bato goes you're an idiot. You don't even know your name. Who's your mother? You know, where are you from? Where to stop? And you see the guy's eyes get a little bit wider as he goes, as he understands, I can't answer this. Because he's yeah. right. I don't know. My yeah. mind is completely white. Yeah. And, you know, so he, you know, there might be some trial and error that, this, that the puppet yeah. was doing. <laughs> yeah. because, because, you know, it, the, the the ambassador that got hacked at the, the beginning of the of, the movie mm. it's the same thing it, you know she, it, he's she's kind of damaged because of his interruption and getting in there and changing things and mm. because they're not compatible it's kind of like you know when you try to put something like when I tried to put something on my old laptop here it's just like yeah it's not going to work and by the way we just blew out about uh, one gig of your memory so all those photos yeah. from that trip you took <laughs> bye. Yeah. you know it, it's kind of like that almost 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, there's it's it's really interesting. Like there's there's a lot of elements around like um, just basic identity, you know, that tie into all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, Any, anything else you wanted to mention, by the way, about Ghost in the Shell before we move on? Um, I, I like the ahead. fact that the manufacturer of the of the shells is just called Mega oh, Mega Megatech. Yeah, Megatech. Yeah. Megatech. <laughs> I'm like. Wow. Boy, you went I, super I'm, generic on that. <laughs> I was expecting something I'm, like, you know, Tachikoma Heavy Industries <laughs> manufacturing <laughs> concern. Like, well, no, it's just mega tech. <laughs> like, mega tech. Awesome. <laughs> Here it is. I think that may be a Dominion Tank um, thing. I'm not oh, sure. Okay. I, have to look that, I have to look that up. Um, but, uh, you know, two things, because I, I, I decided I'm going to get into the, the gun design of, of mm. the... I'll keep it short. But... Uh, the gun design, they, they actually really based it off of real handguns. So the handguns that you see uh, Bato using is, is, is a real, is a real um, mm. a handgun. What Section 6 is using is real. The sniper rifles that were being used in the helicopters are actually based off of British. Uh, I'm forgetting mm. what, what, what they are. But the, yeah. but the FN that the Major uses is, is mm. real. And like I said before, Togus' gun is real. As a matter of fact, you can actually buy a resin replica online of Togus's firearm. Nice. And the, and the thing about Togus's firearm, you notice how it's blocking on the top. That's an actual, mm. that's how it looks. That's how the mm. Unica 2006 looks. The barrel is underneath. It so, like, you know how it fires from the bottom. So from the bottom. Yeah. And the reason why it has the rail on top is that you notice that they. There's a there's a scene where the major goes, "Are you afraid that the semis are gonna um, jam on yeah. you?" Well, the, that the Matiba was made specifically for that purpose was the fact that uh, a revolver doesn't jam, hmm. but it has a double action, meaning that it takes multiple actions for it to fire, and yep. each time you fire, the double action on the Matiba on the Matiba is um, Matiba, sorry, is designed so that the double action only happens on the first pull of the trigger and the rest of it is works like a a um, semi-auto where the gas you know pull pushes the slide back and it reloads the chamber it's pushing the hammer back on the revolver and it's forcing and the, the, the rotating the cylinder, the cylinder and yeah down so that he so that's why toby because i can go pop, 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 put on so many shots the only unrealistic part of that is that when he does the the aiming shot and he puts the the, the tag onto the car, mm. those guns you cannot. They are so hard to aim. Mm. They're notoriously hard to aim. Like you have to be like twenty feet away. Yeah, and or a highly skilled, skilled and highly trained. well, yeah, and yeah. it's that's one of the things Nine they operative. Yeah, which <laughs> is one of the things they establish in like the TV series. They don't establish in the movies. They don't have time. Is Togusa is like the best shot on the force, like yeah, far and away. Like yeah, and granted, even there, like that's pushing it. You know, right? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, but at least there's kind of something behind that. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is one of the cool things about the TV series, which is not to make this about the TV series, one of the things I love about it is it does get into the fact that, like, Togusa is a highly skilled operative who holds his own on Section 9 despite having no, no. Uh, enhancements besides the brain jack. Um, yeah. And, this, there, like, there are points in the TV series where they're like, why do we need all this stuff? Like, maybe we don't need complete cyborg bodies. Maybe that's okay. You know? Hmm. Yeah. Just saying. And for those of you who are a fan of the series and such and love the Tachikomas, mm. uh, they, are, um, they, they are a meld from Dominion Tanks Police, Napoleon, mm -hmm. the regular tanks in that series, mm -hmm. and the tank that you see in, in Ghost in the Shell. Yep. <clears throat> so the Tachikomas are, are just all it's another more than one more reason to watch Dominion Tank. <laughs> you know, it's just wonderful little anime. Mm -hmm. But um but the tanks are some of the designs in this mm. in this movie are just freaking insane. And the fact yeah. that they were able to do it in such a short amount of time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just no time at all. Um like Oshi has said that uh, the reason you haven't seen any like 
um, cut footage from Ghost in the Shell because there wasn't any. Like, we did not have right. time <laughs> to make a longer cut and edit it down, which is, this is all we made. Yeah. Um, anything else? Wonderful movie. Mm. Love it. Yeah. It was good. I, I enjoyed it far more. No, no offense again to the Toonami's uh, mm. bits and pieces that mm. I've seen, but uh, the Tachikoma seemed like dogs. Like they were this funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. the, well, the dubbing voices well, they gave them were all like so cutesy and stuff. Well, that was uh, around, so like, from t- from Tenshi Moyo. Oh yeah, so Sami, every yeah. girl, child, every, every young girl, you know, voice actor in anime voiced Tachikoma. Ed is one of the Tachikomas from Kyoto like, yeah. Um, you haven't gotten to the end of, of that season, though. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, I can't say anything. Yeah. Um, um, and ba- yeah. And Bato has his favorite, even though they're all supposed to be the same. Is this true? Like, yes, yes. There, yeah, on, oh, the whole thing with Bato at the end? Oh. Mm. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, includes a callback to the movie. Um, yeah. they're, 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 you know, they're in different uh, continuities. But there is a reference to a thing Bato does in the movie where he kind of does again in the yeah. in the, okay. the, the TV series, which is so fun. Um, but, he makes uh, one of the Tachikomas into a lolly. <laughs> <laughs> no. How do you quite. find a dress the right size for a small tank uh, or a no. big tank? Um, you do see one of the Tachikomas technically wearing clothes, though, don't you, I think? At yeah, the, the that's right. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> mm-hmm. Interesting. <laughs> after, after one of those goes, goes in a stroll, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a remarkable movie. And, and again, I, I, I want to say this kind of like Evan Galley and a lot of other things. We are not saying that you have to like this movie. We are right. not saying this has to be your favorite movie. Um, you know, like I said, I bounce off it too. Um, but it is a movie that rewards watching with sort of an open mind and with a look towards repeated visuals, repeated imagery. Um, I think there's there's some interesting stuff to kind of pull out of it. Well, I mean, for not having really been into the series, like you guys are way deeper into into understanding all the pieces, parts of it. I found it enjoyable. Mm-hmm. I mean, there wasn't Absolutely. anything. You know what I mean? It's not a slice of life. It's not a school comic. Yeah. It's not one of those <laughs> no, it's watch. not. Definitely not. No. Anything. But it wasn't something that was so technically difficult mm-hmm. and so. Mm-hmm so specific to its source material that it, I'm just looking at it being like, uh, uh mm-hmm. you know I mean, I could be entertained by it, I could understand it, I could grasp the concept behind it, and enjoy it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And to that point, I think if you're going to get into Ghost in the Shell, uh, I think this is a great place to start. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's a, it, it, like you said, it kind of introduces you to all the characters and elements and so forth. Um, it's a specific element. Um... It wets um, the appetite. It wets the appetite, absolutely. And I would say also, like, like the TV series kind of assumes you've watched the movie. You know, like, it's, uh, yeah, it's enough of a that. touchstone. They're kind of like, okay, you know all this stuff. We don't have to explain it all. Right. Um, and Fresh Ingredient in the chat room is absolutely right. When the Wachowskis went to make The Matrix, apparently they sat their staff down, showed them, uh, particularly their, their, their cinematographers, and showed them this movie and said, we want The Matrix to look like this. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Dang. yeah. Ghost in the Shell is, is is a big influence on a lot of post nine nineteen ninety five stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, and by the way, folks, while I do encourage you to watch this, it's a wonderful movie. <clears throat> I I achieved to immensely enjoy it. You don't need it to watch the series. Mm. True. You don't you, you don't need it. It's it's yeah, helpful. Plot wise, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's helpful to kind of have a little bit of a backstory, mm-hmm. but. And also to know that the actual movie is not part of that universe. Yeah, different. You know, but it helps yeah, to have yeah. a primer for who at least you're talking about. You know? <laughs> yeah. Versus coming in cold, yeah. being like, "Who's button eyes? Mm-hmm. Who's that chick? What's going on over here?" Yeah, <laughs> there's an interesting point. I, I will have to go back and rewatch the original Ghost in the Shell, single and complex TV series because I I actually do not know whether those opening episodes do kind of introduce the characters much. Um, oh, that's right. Um, not really, somewhat, because um, it's the whole. Um, what uh, they do is they go yeah. through the abilities. They don't yeah, go through yeah. the backstory. Mm-hmm. They just go through the abilities. Yeah, um, this is the sniper. This is the big dude. This is the you know infiltrator. This is Yakuza guy. This is mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and then explores those you know as the series goes on. Um, yeah, goes in the shell. Fascinating movie. Really interesting. Um, and. Uh, Definitely really, really interesting. Um, Enjoyable. 
enjoy well, thank you thank exactly. you very much for, yes. for having this assistance you're, you're very welcome uh we, we will be getting into other things um um sort of interesting movie wise later on cool um all right let's take a quick break we will come back and get into the news and then we're gonna do something special tonight we're going to um present some 2020 awards <laughs> to some anime that sort of uh, uh, stood out to us over the course of the year. Um, just kind of notable anime of the year 2020, because there was actually a lot of anime this year. Famous um, or infamous. Famous or infamous. Yes. Oh, <laughs> very infamous. Um, ah. So we'll be going to that. Uh, so we will be back with that in just a few minutes. See you then.